Hello, Melbourne. How are you? Yeah, how is tea? Pretty good. All right. <laughs> right on. So yeah, I'm Kat. I work for Ticketmaster. I'm an engineering manager there. I am, uh, let's see, trying to figure out my clicker, obviously. It doesn't like me anymore. Boo. How about that? There we go. Uh, yeah, so I'm really enjoying my Yao tour. I think it's a good evidence of that. This is in Brisbane, along with some of the other ladies of Yao, and I am just so pleased to be here. So thanks for having me. 193, what's special about 193? It's, it's a big number. Yeah, it's all relative, I suppose. <laughs> what else? It's prime, yeah, 193 is a prime number. So I'm here already to give you your first takeaway. And your first takeaway is that if you have to make up a number and have people believe it, you should choose an odd prime number. So if someone says to you, and I've learned this through experience, if someone says to you how long until this feature is done, you don't say two weeks. Two is an even prime number. Uh, you say 17 calendar days. If you say two weeks, someone says, how can we get that down to one? If you say 17 calendar days, they think, wow, she's really thought this through. <laughs> so there you go. Even if you leave right now, you already took away that important piece of information. Uh, yes, yeah, so 193 simple steps to DevOps in your monolith. You may be wondering, what kind of monolith do you have, Kat? Uh, I have an emulated VAX. It's a VAX operating system. <laughs> that was it. <a laughs> I'm already getting heckled. I'm like four slides in. This is ridiculous. OK, so yes. Uh, a buddy of mine, I come from highly regulated industries, so I've worked in technology and like banking and financial services and healthcare and insurance and all of these uh, pretty horrible things. And my friend calls me, I'd worked with him at a bank, and he calls me and says, Kat, will you help us DevOps this thing? And I said, maybe, what is it? And he said, an emulated VAX. And I was like, where do I sign? Um, Yes, so I signed up to DevOps the emulated VAX. And the first question that people always ask me when they hear that I have an emulated VAX is, don't you just love VMS? Does anyone in this room familiar with VMS? It's an operating system for the VAX. VAX is a very old computer. Is everyone, does everyone know what a DEC VAX is? Some people yes, some people no. So it is an old computer. It's not a mainframe, it's a mini, but you don't really care, right? Suffice it to say, it's extremely old. Uh, but VMS still has like this really intense fan club. The people that use VMS as an operating system, they loved VMS. So people are always really sad uh, when they hear that I'm not running VMS on this emulated VAX. In fact, my colleagues at Ticketmaster refer to VMS as VAX made slow. Yeah, so sorry, all you VMS enthusiasts. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, and I will go into them. But yes, they call it VAX made slow. And uh, so if you don't know what a VAX is, that's a VAX. Uh, it is emulated, so it's running on a Linux box, but it's a custom VAX operating system and custom VAX emulation running on a Linux box. Is everyone excited now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so at this point, you're, you're wondering why is there a custom VAX operating system? Why is that a thing? And that was also my question for my friend who called me up, because I very unwisely said, yes, I will DevOps that, before I said, why does that exist? Uh, so why does that exist? Does anyone know what that is at the bottom there? So I think someone said it. It's a PDP-11. Yeah. <laughs> so even older than a VAX, there's a PDP-11. And uh, the original Ticketmaster software was programmed on a borrowed PDP-11. Yes, in 1976. 
And that was actually a really interesting time in 1976 uh, because it was at this weird in-between phase. So up until that point, you know, roughly around that point, uh, you would buy hardware, your company would buy hardware, and you would employ programmers to program that hardware. There wasn't really the idea of buying software for the hardware. So Ticketmaster kind of makes the bet that computers are going to be a thing. They will become ubiquitous. So all companies or all businesses will have a computer, and they will be interested in buying software. So 1976, Ticketmaster makes this kind of big bet. And it, uh, has everyone heard of Conway's Law? Some people yes, some people no. So Conway's Law, I have no doubt, will come up many times in this conference. It basically says that the systems that we create are, are going to mirror the communication patterns that we have within our organizations. And that's what Conway is famous for. But he's done so much awesome stuff since then. And, and this uh, kind of explanation of the history of the computing and software industry and the future of it, I, I think is really interesting and I'll provide links and all that jazz, but uh, suffice it to say, Ticketmaster as a company and as a platform was born at this really interesting time, right in between when you would buy hardware and have programmers program it and when you could actually buy software. So they were kind of betting that at some point you buying software would be a normal thing that you do. And I think it was really courageous, right? What is in the name there? Ticketmaster Computer Ticket Service. They had to put computer in the name because it was not taken for granted that computers would be a thing. And in fact, one of the programmers said he kind of thought of this as like his hobby and that he just wasn't sure if computers were going to pan out. <laughs> and lucky for him, they did, but I like to appreciate at that time what a huge bet this was, right? They were betting that record stores and box offices and all of these places that hadn't traditionally had a computer were going to have a computer and want to sell tickets on that computer. So that is how the custom VAX operating system came to be because they had a very specific use case where they would have tons of people lined up to buy tickets all at once, and they needed this operating system that could be fast, and uh, you know the things that we don't really think about now, like having to print so many tickets rather than just having the roll tickets, have to print tickets and all of these things, right? So that's how there came to be this custom operating system, and that was 1976, so now it's had over 40 years to just get really good at its job. So why does it still exist? Because it's 40 years good at its job, right? And so the first step, for me at least, when I think about DevOpsing, one of these things that, that people say probably can't be DevOps, is to practice a respect for history. So instead of just marching in and saying, why does this VAX operating system even exist anymore in 2019? That's ridiculous, right? Ask instead, why does this exist? And I, I saw this tweet just a few days ago and I really, really liked it, right? How do we end up with this legacy stuff? It's successful. Right? <laughs> like the things that are not successful don't survive. So sometimes we have this tendency to uh, talk negatively about these legacy systems or these monoliths or whatever the case may be. But a lot of times the reason they exist is because some huge portion of our revenue goes through them. Right? They're driving some part of the core business. Uh, and then the reply tweet is my old boss, and I just thought it was hilarious. I'm always trying to come up with all these euphemisms for old code, like, it's not legacy, it's vintage, or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, after that, after I get the story, I now have this appreciation for history, and I'm like, ah, yeah, okay, I see the thing is really well suited for the job that it does, so I can see why you wrote that emulation and all of those things, but why do you want to DevOps it now? It seems like it's been successful for decades. Why do you want to DevOps this now? 
And my buddy told me that it was actually because of a huge failure. <laughs> and that seems like it's often the case. Uh, so he told me that there had been a failed attempt at a complete rewrite. Yeah, I bet a lot of you in the room have been part of one of those, right? Yeah, <laughs> I've seen many of them. <laughs> yeah, so a failed attempt at a complete rewrite, they try to completely rewrite the whole operating system in a different language, not macro 32, shockingly. Uh, and again, I said, okay, well, there was a failed rewrite. Why did you attempt that rewrite? And he said it was to support this shift in the business. So uh, how, with a paper ticket, I sell you the paper ticket, and then what? I don't actually know. You could sell it to someone else. You could use it. You could not, any of those things. It's purely a transaction, right? That's just kind of like one promise. I sell you the ticket. You expect that it will get you into the venue, and that's kind of it. Uh, but now there's this shift happening all over our industry from transactions to relationships. And the example that I use, but it's because I'm American and I'm incredibly fascinated by this, is I now have a relationship with my grocery store. And I just, like, you could not have told me 10 years ago that I would have a relationship with my grocery store, but now I'm... Like, if I don't get the alert, my son loves apples and he's really picky about apples. And he'll like take a bite of a Fuji apple and like throw it on the ground and be like, this isn't a honey crisp. I don't even know if you have those apples here. But like now, if I don't get the alert from my grocery store that the apple that I want is there and on sale and I want to be able to like order it for delivery or I'm going to swing by after work and pick it up, all of these things, right? I'm like, what is this world, you know? Uh, so that is shifting all over our industry. Has anyone purchased a phone recently? Yes, yeah, yeah, several people. Uh, so how was the experience of painstakingly copying each phone number, deciding like, is this person worth it for me to expend the energy to copy them over to my new phone? That's not a thing we do anymore, right? No, of course not. You have a relationship with Google, you have a relationship with Apple, or whatever. I don't know what kind of phone you have, right? Samsung, whatever. Uh, and that relationship is persistent across whatever device you interact on, right? So it's this fundamental shift, and it, I, I love talking about this and how we're enabling this through technology. Uh, so if you want to catch me during the happy hour or whatever, I'd love to talk more about it. But suffice it to say, uh, Ticketmaster recognized that this shift is happening and that OS is purely based on a transactional model and wasn't designed to support relationships. So there needs to be something else in that ecosystem aside from the transaction engine to support relationships. That kind of makes sense, right? Would you really want your transaction engine itself to be supporting the relationships? That seems weird. Okay, so now I understand there was a failed rewrite. They were trying to rewrite because there's a shift from transactions to relationships. So now I understand that uh, we have to, somewhere in the ecosystem, be able to build the support for relationships. Got it. Is anyone familiar with this, the toaster project? A couple people, right on, yay. <laughs> OK, so if you want to enable this higher order innovation, we have to be able to build relationships on top of this transaction engine, right? Trying to construct relationships across all of these different transactions. Uh, we need to basically make the transaction engine a commodity. So what happens in the toaster project is this guy says, I would like to make a toaster from scratch. And so he like goes to the mine to get the iron ore or whatever. And all of these things, he tries to make a toaster, which is something that all of us take for granted, right? This morning when you got up and made toast, were you like, oh my goodness. What a piece of machinery. <laughs> Likely not, right? Uh, but <laughs> it, it might have been slightly more conspicuous if the toaster looked like this and burst into flames the moment you started using it, right? 
Yeah, so there are a lot of things that have to be treated as commodity before we get the toaster. And that's how innovation happens, right? We are, we get things to a state where they're working so well that we no longer even notice them. They're not conspicuous anymore. We take them for granted and we're able to build on top of them and that's what drives innovation. So if we want to do that, if we want to make space to explore this new business model and how we might support that through technology, then what we have to do is shift this transaction engine from being something really custom. Remember I said it's a custom Vax OS, custom emulation, and we have to shift that to much more of a commodity. Is anyone already familiar with this evolution? A few people. Uh, so Genesis, all the way on the left there, is uh, this thing is brand new. Someone would have to like explain to you how to use it. It's highly conspicuous. Custom is exactly what it sounds like. Product is pretty much what it sounds like. You could buy it off the shelf. And commodity are the things you don't even notice, like electricity. Do you know how the electricity? that's powering this room was made? No, and you probably wouldn't have even noticed it until I, I drew attention to it. So if we want to enable the higher order innovation to support relationships in the ecosystem, then we have to move the transaction engine, uh, that custom operating system more towards commodity so that people, it's really repeatable, people can just count on it and they can start to build new things on top of it to support relationships. Yes? We good with that? We not so good with that? We need more tea? Okay. And of course, there's this classic quote, right? If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. That's what we're trying to get away from, right? We think that you should be able to go to the store and buy flour and all these things, and that's uh, kind of how we have to think about this transaction engine. If you can't take for granted, those things, then you won't be able to build the relationships on top. So what I had to set about doing was distinguishing between value added variety, which would be all of the new things that we can build on top where we're not only getting information about our, our new way of uh, interacting with customers, but getting a lot of information from customers, right? The variety in the market is valuable to us. Uh, the variety of shepherding a custom Vax OS into production by hand, right? I like to say uh, vintage, vintage code, artisanal deployments. Oh. Mm. <laughs> that, my friends, is not value added variety. So that is, when we have really manual processes like that, that is. Uh, introducing variety, but it is not the kind that we can make money off of. It is actually the kind that takes away from our ability to make money. And I think that's kind of how we ended up at DevOps to begin with. Uh, in Brisbane, I called it the dad pants manifesto instead of the agile manifesto. And one guy laughed so hard and everyone else was so angry. Uh, <laughs> so sorry, Brisbane. <laughs> but yes, the agile manifesto, a bunch of uh, dudes get together at a ski lodge and drink a bunch of whiskey and write this thing. Uh, and what is it? Well, it's basically an idea of how we can metabolize information from the market more quickly, right? More efficiently, get more information, learn more quickly. We want to deploy working code to the market frequently so that we can learn what the market wants. Yeah? So we metabolize information through code. And then what happens? We end up with a bunch of code that we're pushing to production all the time, right? And so uh, we kind of have to strike this balance between the metabolism, our ability to metabolize new information from the market, and the energy that we are putting into maintaining what is there. Yeah, so why do organisms die? Nice, happy topic for, after, for the afternoon. 
because this balance is off, right? So if you as an organism are already in some uh, compromised state, and then there's a perturbation in your market even, or in your environment, even if it's a small one, like you catch a cold or something like that, it can be hugely damaging because you're already devoting so much energy to just keeping alive that you don't have the energy to deal with these different things from your environment. And it's the same for us in our organizations, in our technology organizations, right? Uh, if we are spending, we have just one pot of money and energy and people, right? All of this capacity. And if we're allocating a bunch of it or if we're just forced to consume a bunch of it in maintaining what is there, then we will lose resources for metabolizing information from the market. Does that make sense to everyone? I'll give you a, a concrete example from my, my work. Uh, so we have this system and uh, it went down. But the fallback was so good that no one notices that it went down. Terrific, right? Wonderful. Except for the fallback consumes like basically the whole capacity of our whole Melbourne team which is not ideal, right? But when you just look at like the performance metrics and those kinds of things, all, everyone, all the executives said, well, this, why is this even a big deal? It seems fine. Because we weren't, the customers weren't calling us, they weren't upset or anything like that, but when we take on this frame and we say we now lost a whole team's ability to metabolize new information, they're now wholly dedicated to just maintaining our current state, then that becomes kind of a sadness, yes? Yeah, so I think from this frame, that's how we ended up with DevOps. We it vastly, with Agile, we vastly increased our ability to metabolize information from our market. But then we didn't quite keep pace with our ability to maintain, right? So then we see, we see the rise of DevOps, and I think it wasn't just the extension, like the natural extension of Agile, first swallow up QA and then swallow up ops. I think it was actually this other pattern where in order to survive, our organizations understood that they're intuitively or it was like an emergent need to uh, balance between metabolizing new information and maintaining. So how do we actually strike that balance? How do we actually get to DevOps? Is it tools? Who thinks it's tools? Don't be shy. This is not a tool-loving crowd. Yeah, so some, but you must admit, you know someone, right, who's like, yes, you just purchase tools and then you become DevOps, right? And now, like, what I really enjoy is that we're looking for like the one tool to rule them all that's just like eating up more and more of the and, like, first it was a CI tool and now it's a CI and a CD tool and it also like shines your shoes and pours you a bowl of cereal or whatever, right? So there is this idea. Uh, or could it be that we send everyone, we just need to increase skills, DevOps skills, so we like, send the developers and the operators to training and the operators learn engineering skills and now they all put SRE on their resume and the engineers kind of like look up salaries online and decide if they should put SR in front of their E or not. <laughs> we send everyone to training. Who believes that is the path? You increase everyone's skills. I'm hoping that it's because you don't believe that's the path and you're not just totally like asleep right now. No one's raising their hands because they don't even know what's happening. Okay, how about this? DevOps is a state of mind. You just focus on the DevOps totem, which is the Phoenix project. And you become DevOps and you're able to mentally clear all your DevOpsticles. <laughs> but this, 
Okay, maybe this has not happened to you. I will tell you about my friend. That was a wink, wink. My friend works somewhere where the executives bought copies of the Phoenix Project, like for everyone. And my friend thought, oh, that's so nice. They're like investing in us, getting us this nice book about theory of constraints, so sweet. Then my friend realized that that book came with strings attached. And the expectation was that you would read the book and you would be transformed like the phoenix and you would rise and you would magically be an SRE, rising from the ashes of your former engineer or operator self. Uh, yeah, so we've had that, right? It's just a state of mind, you change your mind. Could it be all three? I don't think it could be any one of those, but I think maybe it could be all three of those. Any takers? Uh, and I think I have had, a, or yeah, I mean, I know, I have had a lot of uh, luck approaching DevOps transformations, including in this case with my sweet baby Vax. Uh, using social practice theory. Is anyone familiar with social practice theory? Some people. Um, okay, so what it is, it basically there, there's a great post on this, so if you wanna look it up, you can. But basically, uh, social practice theory says that practices are made up of meaning, competence, and material. So, Maybe it is like the, the DevOps state of mind. I know why I'm doing this, right? And the DevOps set of skills and the materials, the actual tools and the way that we implement things. And I have found it to be an incredibly useful frame for looking at these sorts of transformations. And I'll give you an example from my journey with the sweet baby back. So, uh, before the DevOps journey starts, uh, we, there's not proper testing, there's not proper deployments, right? Everything is artisanal. Uh, so what is code review about in that scenario? The practice of code review. It's about ensuring quality, right? We all need to look at the code together to ensure quality. And after we have implemented a proper pipeline and come to terms with the fact that it's 2019 and there's just not a lot of Macro 32 programmers out there in the world, now what is code review about? For us, it became about skills duplication. So we are embarking on this journey of breaking certain capabilities out of the emulation, rewriting them in Rust, any Rust fans in the room? Yeah, I know, yeah, I'm liking it so far. So we are rewriting some capabilities in Rust. Uh, in order to do that, it's, right now it's not like terribly hard to go find someone who wants to learn Rust. Uh, so we're able to do that, but still that person, there's very low likelihood that they are familiar with Vax assembly. So code reviews at this point become about skills duplication. We need to understand how the code works, how does this custom operating system work, how are all these pieces interacting. Uh, so that fundamentally changes the meaning of code review in this scenario. Now we have a pipeline that can test for quality and now code review is about duplicating skills within the team as we look to transform this monolith. So then what skills do we need in order to do that? Yes, some of the existing programmers had to learn Git. That's not a huge ask, right? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, but then the other thing there is that uh, there needs to be skill around not necessarily being clever, right, but uh, reading and writing for understanding. Knowing that our goal is not just to stay where we are, but to keep evolving this thing. So we're trying to write and read for understanding rather than just ensuring quality. And then there's the actual change of the material of the practice uh, you know, there's GitLab, there's also the fact that we're changing from 
the assembly to rust, so those are the actual things that are material of the practice. If we were to change any one of those in isolation, it would not really get us any closer to our goal, right? But if we change all three, it does help us get closer to our goal. So here we get a lot of benefits. We have more programmers who understand how this old system works and how it should work. We also have more people who can go on call. Right? We've now instituted that there should be on call from the engineering side. And now we have more people who understand how this works and can go on call. And when we have on-call engineers, it does increase, at least in our situation, it increases our ability to absorb some of that variability. Something goes wrong and uh, someone from the operations team can reach out to the on-call engineer and sort it out. And then as a benefit from that, again, we get more learning in the team. So it kind of has this cascading benefit. So if you want to DevOps your monolith, you just do that 193 times. I hope you enjoy my TED talk. <laughs> That's not the end. Come on. I still have like 15 minutes left. <laughs> All right. So, uh, no, I have no idea how many times we've done that. I, it could be more than 193. It could be less. Uh, if my boss asks, it's definitely 193. Uh, but what we did do is through this practice, going through this over and over again, we kind of came up with a set of uh, heuristics. So if you want to know more about heuristics, you should definitely go talk to Rebecca Worfsbrock, who is amazing, and she's here, and we're all so lucky to have her here at this event. So we come up with these heuristics, which are just like kind of little rules of thumb to help us uh, think about the work that we have to do and kind of evaluate the challenges that we meet as we're trying to DevOps this thing. Uh, so the first one, we need to let this transaction engine sell tickets. It does so many other things. It was a whole operating system. Because there were at, in 1976, there was a very real chance that this would be the only computer that existed in whatever business was selling the tickets. So it has like a messaging system, so it's pre-email. There's a game. Those things probably don't need to exist, right? And then there's lots of other capabilities that are actually still useful in our current context, but they shouldn't be part of a transaction engine. They shouldn't be part of something that we're trying to just move as far towards commodity as we possibly can, right? So whenever possible, we want to remove those things from the transaction engine and just let it transact, right? Good little guideline. So when we get feature requests, this is a lot of times what we push back with. Like, that sounds like a really good feature. We understand the value. We're not going to implement it in the VAX because we're trying to just let this sell tickets. Of course, my favorite, respect for history, right? So before we say that's a stupid idea, right, or why does this even exist, we first want to understand that. We're not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to understand and appreciate. And honestly, having that understanding has helped us with a lot of other things that are very modern and current. But there, when you have just such constrained resources, like the VAX in 1976, that mindset is all about the efficient use of resources. And that's not something that a lot of us have now, but under certain constraints, right, like connectivity constraints or whatever the case may be, it's sometimes very helpful to take on that mindset of efficiently, efficiency and dealing with constraints. All right, material heuristic. When possible, buy. I don't know how many times I've used the word custom in this talk, but it was too many. And I'm not really looking to use it a lot more. So we're not, even though we have this beautiful little snowflake of an operating system, we're not looking to write any custom tools. We're always going to look to see, can we adopt a tool that's readily available out there and then see how we can make it work in this situation rather than 
like trying to come up with our own thing. If you want to see me laugh, cry, go through a whole roller coaster of emotion, ask me about Kubernetes and the VAX. Because that has been a very interesting journey. All right, and then competence or skills. We are really lucky because this is, uh, our leadership understands, luckily we're coming out of that failed rewrite. So our leadership understands that this process will take time. And so everyone is mostly on board with us making this trade off. If we're ever forced to choose, we are going to choose increasing the liquidity of skills within our team, of key skills within our team over speed. So if we're forced to choose, we would rather take longer to deliver something, but have more people understand how it works rather than just try to get the damn thing out the door. So we're really focused right now when we have so few uh, VAX assembly programmers, we're really focused on increasing the liquidity of skills. So getting crucial skills duplication so that we're able to move forward and we're able to absorb variability like people going on vacation. That's the thing people should be allowed to do. Uh, so these are kind of our rules, our loose rules that we're using to approach things and uh, make decisions about how we should DevOps this monolith. So I think a really important thing there that I will say over and over and over and over and over and over again is DevOps is not just a mindset. I understand that it would be really nice if we could just all set our minds to being DevOps and then suddenly be DevOps. I don't know if any of you have been through this situation, right? Where someone says we're going through a DevOps transformation. Are you not a team player? I've certainly had people say that to me, but so we need to build awareness about the fact that we do have this organizational inertia, right? We have a set of tools that have been used. We have code that has been created and developed in a very specific manner. And it takes time to evolve all of those things together. And it's not just a set of tools, not just a mindset, not just a set of tools. You can't buy tools and be DevOps. All of us in this room, I would venture, I guess, probably know that. But it becomes really frustrating when you have someone telling you, like, I bought you this tool, why are you not DevOps yet? Or we had an offsite, we did some team building, why are we not DevOps yet? It's wonderful to have collaboration across dev and ops, and it's wonderful to have everyone have this positive attitude about a transition of that nature, but it's nowhere near sufficient. DevOps is fundamentally a socio-technical approach. You cannot separate the technology and the people. And I think that's kind of, it kind of just, that is how our world is now. You cannot separate the technology and the people. And right now, socio-technical, it's becoming a buzzword. Everyone really loves to say it, but it's actually very old. Yeah, so the, the term socio-technical was coined in the World War II era. It's been around for a while. We just kind of forgot about it. And I feel like I've said almost this exact thing so many times before. I think I said almost this exact thing earlier today, sitting right back there. So this quote is like from the 50s. It has been fashionable as of late to assume that the actual job, its technology, and its mechanical and physical requirements are relatively unimportant compared to the social and psychological situations of men at work. We can't just ignore the technology. We are technologists, we can't ignore the technology and we should throw a fit when people ask us to do that, right? To ignore the technology or to ignore the fact that we need to be happy and engaged in our work. These are just all things that go together. So it's a socio-technical approach and that means 
in many, 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 many cases that we have complex systems, right? And we are people interacting with machines and we are shaping the way they do things and they are shaping the way that we do things and we're acting on each other and we're part of one system and the system is acting on us and we're acting on the system. It's very complex. So there are not 193 simple steps for DevOps in your monolith. There's an infinite number of ways that you could do that, right? And some patterns have definitely emerged, but each one of us has some system that is actually unique. And so we're going to have to find our own path for DevOpsing, whatever it is. This is from a great poem. You should look it up. Uh, so I have all of these resources. I also put them all in a blog where it just says like, uh, how they relate to the talk. Uh, so you can look them up. But my hope is that all of us go forward and we take on uh, this idea of the fact that we're participating in socio-technical ecosystems. And we kind of revive that because I feel like it kind of got uh, forgotten there for a few decades. And I hope since you're here that you're interested in, in joining that and doing that with me. So uh, this time it's for real. My talk is actually over. If you want to find me in the hallway, uh, that would be rad. I would love to talk about this stuff or at drinks or whatever the case may be. I really want to talk about this stuff, right? None of us have any idea what we're doing, so we should be talking with each other more. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you.